I was happy to meet Ken when he was uh, chief of staff uh, for the late uh, councilwoman Happy Fernandez back in the uh, in the 90s. And uh, we, uh, I think we struck a friendship back then because we did a, a couple of projects together, worked together and play softball together as well in the in the city league, which was always a good, a good way to, to get to know people. Uh, since leaving public service, uh, Ken immediately went to work uh, opening a series of restaurants. I had the opportunity to go and eat at the first restaurant he opened up in Germantown Avenue in Mount Airy, uh, which location still serves as a, rest as a restaurant uh, still to this day. Uh, he was uh, instrumental after that in the, uh, the creation of the uh, of a real estate company that began to do very responsible development. Uh, and as well as continue to uh, be very active in the public sector uh, by uh, chairing the uh, Philadelphia Housing Development Corporation, which uh, he was appointed by uh, Mary uh, Nutter and Kenny. Uh, he also co-founded the uh, Mount Airy Business Improvement District and currently uh, serving as his chair. He's also created this very unique uh, kind of uh, 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 mentoring and incubating uh, program called Jumpstart. Jumpstart Germantown and Jumpstart Philly. I know a couple of my friends have gone through the program and they speak very highly of it. Uh, Ken is also very well known because uh, his, one of his signature businesses was the, uh, the trolley car. Uh, that many of us had uh, visited over the years. Uh, it was a favor of my late uh, mother-in-law. Uh, and Ken continues to be very active politically. Uh, he's uh, a person to go to if you are in the uh, progressive thinking uh, community of people running for office. So without more to do, please uh, join me in and welcome in uh, Ken Weinstein. Ken, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pedro, for that nice uh, introduction. You uh, saved me uh, my first page, so we don't have to uh, go back into it. But let me share my screen, if uh, just bear with me for a minute. Cool. Everyone can see that? Yep. OK, great. Um, and Pedro, it's always great to work with you. We, we did have a great uh, relationship and friendship in, in City Hall that has uh, maintained all these years. And you were an outstanding uh, infielder, if I remember, uh, in our softball league. So I, I, I cherish those moments. I still have my City Council softball shirt, which I wear now and then. So do I, by the way. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. We got to get together and, and do it again. Um, so yeah, I'm not going to uh, continue on my, my intro uh, other than to tell you a little about Philly Office Retail. Um, for years, people knew me because of my restaurants, um, but to be honest, that uh, used up a fairly small amount of my time, uh, maybe five hours a week. Uh, my passion uh, and most of my time has gone into real estate development over the years. And to be honest, you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, why the restaurant business? And first answer is insanity. Um, but then I, uh, what the restaurants were really about was economic development projects. So, you know, each one was vacant and deteriorated prior to us opening a restaurant. And we saw a need in the community. We saw a building that needed to be saved. We saw blight that needed to be removed. And, and that's why I got into the restaurant business. Uh, after 25 years, I am finally out uh, as of last summer when we closed uh, Trolley Car Cafe uh, in East Falls. Um, life has gotten a lot better since then, needless to say. Um, Philly Office Retail, uh, I've been real estate developer for 35 years now, uh, since the late 80s. Uh, Philly Office Retail currently owns 800,000 plus square feet uh, that we developed, that we own and manage. Uh, specifically, I spent my first 10 years uh, 
in real estate, uh, rehabbing single family homes, like a lot of people, and then switched over to commercial development, which I very much enjoy, partly because it, it allows me to pick and choose uh, tenants that we think will be good uh, for neighborhoods and uh, tenants that we think can make it. Uh, and at the same time, amenities uh, for those communities that we're investing in and trying to serve. Uh, so we currently have a staff of about 25 people and we specifically up till now have looked for vacant deteriorated commercial properties that we can renovate uh, and reuse. And therefore I consider what we do uh, mission oriented. Um, so we're gonna cover a couple things today. Firstly, what does it mean to be a community developer? Uh, secondly, we'll take a look at some of our Philly office retail projects. And lastly, uh, we'll finish up, uh, depending on how much time we have, uh, with an overview of uh, our Jumpstart, Germantown Jumpstart Philly program for those of you who uh, don't know as much about it. But it's nice to see a lot of uh, old young friends on uh, the call today and uh, really glad to be here. Uh, so what does it mean to be a community developer? Um, when it comes to real estate development, there is a lot of terms that get thrown around. Uh, community developer, you know, which to me means thinking about community needs and wants as you invest. Um, it doesn't mean, I'll just say this, that I'm seeking or we're seeking consensus uh, because there will always be opposition to any good idea out there. So at some point you have to look inside yourself and evaluate what you're doing and talk to enough people that you feel comfortable you're heading in the right direction, uh, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, there are some people call uh, community development triple bottom line developing, which is incorporating social, environmental, and financial into your investment goals. There's uh, what people call 3P, people, profit, planet. I sit on the board of a large uh, real estate development company in Baltimore uh, that uses this approach. Um, there's mission-oriented developer, which was the focus of an article in last week's Philadelphia Business Journal. Uh, there's social impact developer, which is a hot topic these days in crowdsourcing. So call it whatever you will, um, but it's ultimately about how you distinguish yourself from being a solely profit-oriented developer. Um, so we're looking beyond the renovation or construction of one building. Uh, and to be honest, it's not what developers typically do. I'm not particularly proud of my development colleagues. Um, and it's really, that's really one of the reasons why I started the Jumpstart program seven years ago in order to try to bring more like-minded people into the industry. So let me um, go through um, you know, three, what I consider three components of being a community developer. Uh, first is looking at more than just profits. So if we want to take real estate development to the next level, we need to take off our blinders and pay attention to the neighborhood in which we're working or investing. Uh, and this is something I, I teach in the Jumpstart program. Uh, but at the same time, don't ignore the profit motive. Uh, it's a powerful tool and it's ultimately what brings funding and resources to projects that improve the community. So there's nothing wrong with being a nonprofit developer, um, but uh, I find that if you can show profit there is essentially an unlimited amount of uh, uh, bank financing that you can bring to uh, projects. Uh, so here's a couple of my beliefs. Uh, the first is karma, that helping others is the best way to help yourself. And it all comes around. And I've been a true believer in this over the years. Um, you have nothing if you don't have a good reputation. So you want to be in real estate development for the long term. People want to work with successful people who are making a difference. 
Um, and finally, don't just renovate houses, change the world. Write your next chapter, feel good about what you're doing. You know, 35 years later, uh, I still can't wait to go to work every day so I can help to improve the communities in which I'm working. Um, so uh, working, secondly, working with the community, uh, what you wanna do, and again, this is something I teach over and over again in Jumpstart, listen to the community, really listen, open your mind, not don't just pay it lip service. You know, is the community worried about increasing prices, gentrification, uh, don't hide? Um, do they want high-end properties to increase the tax base and satisfy demand? Or do they want affordable housing to house those with low or moderate incomes? And uh, uh, one thing I correct people on a lot is don't just talk about affordable housing, make sure you define it. You know, are you talking about low-income housing? Are you talking about housing for the homeless? Are you talking about workforce housing? You know, they all have very specific definitions. Uh, community developers take the time to connect with neighbors near their development project and build their trust. Don't assume no neighbors know what you're doing and why you're doing it. So start at the beginning, you know, make sure you're covering, you know, what you're trying to accomplish in the neighborhood uh, because you will face immediate opposition if you don't take the time to uh, explain your motives and help to educate uh, community members. Um, how do you do this? You knock on doors, you engage with your neighbors. Um, here's a picture of me going door to door in the Wayne Junction neighborhood on Apsley Street. Um, you know, so it doesn't matter how big you get as a developer, you know, make sure you're uh, handing out flyers in the neighborhood, make sure you're posting on Facebook, make sure you're going door to door and explaining your project to people. Hold open houses before and after your projects. It's one of the things I enjoy the most uh, because I particularly enjoy showing off my projects. Don't minimize, ignore, get defensive or belittle uh, neighborhood concerns. Get involved in the community, proactively reach out to RCOs, uh, CDCs, other stakeholders, attend meetings, get to know the larger community. You know, you don't want to be that politician, all due respect to politicians. You don't want to be that politician that shows up every two or four years when they're running for re-election. You want to be a neighborhood partner, uh, not an adversary. Uh, you want to be that person that communicates and reaches out to the community before you need something from them. Um, push for neighborhood improvements. Uh, look beyond the renovation or construction of your property. Very few developers do this. Neighborhoods need better lighting, clean sidewalks, healthy street trees, beautification like murals, and much more. So don't leave it up to someone else to get it done. Be proactive and gain community trust and respect by uh, figuring out what the community mean, needs and then go for it. Um, so do your work above board, obtain permits, be transparent, publicly state your goals. Think like a member of the community, even if you're not, and you will be a better developer. Uh, your reasonable critics will make you a better developer if you let them. And what do I mean by that? I, I divide all neighborhood people into three groups. And of course, there's a lot of shades of gray here, but there's people that will oppose my projects no matter what. There are people that will support my projects no matter what. Um, and then there's this in-between group, which is the group that I'm focusing on. I appreciate people supporting me no matter what, but I'm listening to the group in the middle, which are people that are logical, that will support your project if it's the right project, will even more importantly make suggestions to you so that you can uh, do a better project or maybe make changes to your project that are more reasonable. So that's the group I'm paying attention to more than anything. And then third uh, on this list is paying attention to the environment. And I'm certainly far from perfect, but again, trying to listen to people who know about these things. 
Um, so think about what you're doing and how you're doing it. Try to reuse buildings rather than demolishing them and starting over. This has been a central part of my mission-oriented work. Um, but in my mind, this is the best environmental strategy is the reuse of buildings. Everything else that you could do, solar, um, green roofs, uh, stormwater management, you know, low-hanging fruit like bike parking, Energy Star appliances, low water faucets, you know, lights on motion detectors, all that kind of stuff uh, is window dressing compared to whether you're trying to reuse the building that you're in uh, and therefore not demolishing it and then having to put that into the landfill. Um, so all these things are not important. Uh, there's some developers that do this stuff better than others, but in my mind, it all starts it, uh, with whether you're reusing the building or not. Um, so good community developers also try to get involved with local, state, national policy discussions, uh, like the one hopefully that we're going to have today. Um, you have to be vocal and an advocate for development policies that will benefit good development and the community as a whole. So you can't, again, you can't just go under a rock and as you're developing and just focus on your project, you need to be thinking about the bigger picture here. Uh, and there are certainly some good developers that do that. Um, Philly Office Retail, for example, uh, its development work has directly impacted by some of the following, historic preservation and reuse. Um, so we were uh, big advocates and proponents of, uh, as Bob Thomas knows, the uh, Wayne Junction Historic District and the Mount Airy Historic District, where we have a lot of holdings. Um, the histor uh, historic designation incentives, which allow uh, dwelling units, uh, ease zoning restrictions, and reduce parking requirements. In my mind, that was a great thing that happened. I think it's been about three years now uh, by city council ordinance. Uh, state and national historic tax credits enable a lot of what we're able to do. I know on the national level, uh, there's movement to try to raise historic tax credits from 20 to 30%, which uh, doesn't sound like a lot, but that 10% incremental change in your construction costs can make or break a project and potentially enable a project to, uh, to do adaptive reuse to move forward. Uh, state historic tax credits have uh, very much helped us. Unfortunately, I think we're still sitting at $3 million statewide in terms of uh, total budget, but we have uh, been able to get uh, a number of these state historic tax credits anywhere from 25 to $225,000 per building. Um, to me, another policy decision that uh, has really helped adaptive reuse is new tax abatement, uh, the new tax abatement differential that uh, uh, provides greater benefit to the reuse of properties rather than the demo and new construction of properties. Uh, the zoning process uh, is an ongoing uh, headache, I think, for everybody, developers, neighbors, uh, policy folks. Uh, in my mind, uh, all the changes that have been made to the zoning process uh, don't work until every Council district uh, undergoes zoning remapping, which our council district has not for the most part. Uh, when I say our district, the eighth district, uh, Northwest Philly. Um, so we're still very much um, beholden to the ZBA and zoning variances. Um, and as I go through projects, I'll mention which ones needed variants. Uh, affordable housing, obviously a very big topic today. Um, a lot of people want to put uh, the need for affordable housing on developers, which I don't take personal, but it's not going to provide the number of housing units, affordable housing units that we need. It, the need is so big out there that at the end of the day, in my mind, uh, the federal government needs to uh, put you know, millions of vouchers into play 
so that people can live where they want, they can live in mixed income communities. And that's what's going to solve the problem, not, you know, a couple dozen uh, affordable units here and there that uh, people are using as a possible solution. Uh, the first time home buyers program uh, is thankfully coming back to Philly. That made a big difference last time it was in play. And uh, I know it's coming back around. Um, uh, programs like uh, BSRP and AMP, uh, Basic Systems Home Repair and Adoptive Modification Program uh, that are run by PHDC, which I, I chair, you know, keeps low income people in their homes. And uh, one is that helps to avoid displacement, right, and gentrification. Uh, but at the end, of the, but but at the same time, it allows the city to put fifteen or twenty thousand dollars into a property, so it doesn't go vacant and and eventually deteriorates. And then one of my jumpstart grads has to spend a hundred thousand dollars renovating that property. So better to look ahead, better to keep people uh, where they live. Uh, and then last but not least is public-private partnerships that we're always looking at. They can be very frustrating for a developer like me because I'm a cowboy uh, and I like to just go off and, and, and do what I need to do and not have government hold me back. Uh, but we actively work with SEPTA, uh, Mural Arts, Commerce Department, Streets Department, uh, Pennsylvania Horticulture Society, Water Department on stormwater management and many more. So it, it, if you're a community developer, um, you're ultimately going to have public-private partnerships that uh, help you work ahead and not work behind. So uh, anyway, that's. let me stop there and let's uh, uh, jump into uh, real quick some projects because everyone likes to look at pretty pictures and uh, see the kind of stuff that we're doing. So firstly, uh, this is certainly not an affordable housing uh, project. Uh, these are, uh, we took this church, Mount Airy Presbyterian Church, and took the classroom part of it, uh, which was about 25, 30,000 square feet and made it into 19 residential condos. Uh, the church itself, we leased recently to after the church stayed for another seven years after we bought the building, we leased it to Lantern Theater that is seeking uh, zoning approval right now uh, to uh, um, you know, add uh, some nice uh, amenities to the commercial corridor in Mount Airy. Um, we needed to go through zoning on this. Um, several years ago, since then, there was zoning remapping in Upper Mount Airy. So this is now appropriately zoned CMX 2.5, I believe. Um, this has a very high walkability factor. What's attracting people to a building like this is being on Germantown Avenue, uh, German, uh, uh, Germantown Avenue in Mount Airy and Chestnut Hill were recently featured in Philly Mag. Um, so it's a real nice chance. People who are buying into this have a really nice chance to live on the avenue and walk to a lot of restaurants and amenities. Uh, this is in the Mount Airy Historic District, uh, which was uh, recently put into place that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so just some shots of the inside. You know, when you're doing adaptive reuse, you, you try to keep a lot of the historic elements. Uh, and this is uh, one of the condos that uh, recently sold. Uh, we added raised beds so that the uh, residents of these condos could uh, grow their own uh, gardens and fruits and vegetables. And just a shot of one of the rooftop decks. Um, this is a project that I particularly love that we completed last summer, uh, Market Square Apartments in Germantown. Uh, it was, it, it is a historically designated property and announced, uh, I think yesterday is the winner of, one of the winners of this year's Preservation Alliance Community Preservation Awards. Um, it's the birth site of Louisa May Alcott, who was the author of Little Women. 
and later in the late 1800s became the Germantown Masonic Hall. Um, so a zoning a variance was obtained for this property. Uh, it's on Germantown Avenue, but it's owned RSA3. So we could have used it as a church. We could have used it as a single family home and not a whole lot else. So again, this is a, a perfect case of why zoning remapping is needed. Um, but it is historically designated. Um, and uh, after, a, uh, you know, it was, wasn't an easy battle, even for a property like this. Uh, it was mostly vacant. It was previously used for Cunningham showroom factory, but it, the building was in very poor condition. Uh, the first floor is now used as a photography gallery and a dance studio. And there are 16 apartments upstairs and in the rear. Um, we have rented 14 out of the 16 so far uh, and people very much enjoy living there. Just a shot of the inside, you get a feel for uh, the replacement windows that we put in that were uh, historically significant. It's a little patio in the first floor. And I love the uh, hallway because we were able to restore the terrazzo floors and also the original light fixture that was in the foyer. So I think it turned out really nice. This is a project that we just finished. We had an open house here in early February um, and a, a second winner this year. We were a, a two-time winner for this year's uh, Preservation Awards. Um, we also had to get a zoning variance for this property. Uh, it was zoned I-2, which is uh, industrial. Um, this is in Wayne Junction, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about, but this is our big project right now. We're uh, renovating uh, or building on 13 uh, sites in Wayne Junction um, and for the most part, it was uh, a, a blighted uh, area uh, previously used for uh, industrial uses. The Max Levy building, which is this building, uh, uh, existed here since 1902, and we now call it autograph apartments. Um, so we received state and federal historic tax credits on this project. Uh, we made 32 apartments, and over the last three weeks, we were able to rent 21 of the 32 apartments. So it's very desirable. Uh, this one I would consider more affordable in terms of workforce housing. Rents uh, are in the range of 800 to 1500 a month, which is why I think they're leasing up so quickly. Uh, picture of the front of the building. Uh, we'll be adding street trees because Wayne Junction has a lot of concrete and not a lot of green. Um, and we were able to keep the industrial feel, as you can see, uh, particularly from the ceiling of this building. Um, and because we got historic tax credits, the threshold um, was high in terms of what we had to maintain, not just on the exterior, but also on the interior. It's a picture of what the inside looks like now. So a project that we're definitely proud of. Here's some projects that are currently in process. Um, this is our first large new construction project, which will help tie in a lot of pieces of Wayne Junction, because this sits in the middle of Wayne Junction on Berkeley Street. Um, we have not done anything uh, nearly this large previously, but it's going to be 143 apartments, 92 parking spots, half of which are underground, um, and uh, two commercial spaces, including, as you can see, a diner that we're putting front and center. Uh, historically, a lot of, you know, again, talking to the neighbors, a lot of neighbors wanted uh, the Wayne Junction Diner to come back. There was a Wayne Junction Diner for years on Wayne Avenue. Um, well, we're not 
doing it on Wayne Avenue, but we're doing this right around the corner. We brought this diner down from Connecticut and we're putting it uh, in the front. So looking for a restaurant operator and then there will be a second commercial space. Uh, we made sure that the height of this building um, almost exactly matched the height of the factory building that was on this site previously until 2012 when the city demolished it. Um, parking, as you can imagine, is one of these hot potatoes. Uh, we ended up uh, producing two times the amount of parking that is required for this project. Um, that was too much for some people and not enough for a lot of people, but we, we tried to strike a middle balance in order to, again, do the right thing. It doesn't mean uh, everyone's going to agree with it, but we feel like we, we struck that balance with this project. Uh, this is a building that we're currently working on in East Falls uh, on Stokely Street, right off of Fox. It's near, uh, those of you who know East Falls, it's near the Baker Square Shopping Center. 21,000 square foot uh, former industrial building. Uh, the nonprofit Rebuilding Together is going to have offices and warehouse space on the second floor, and we're still seeking tenants for the first and third floor. Uh, but this is a, a fun, smaller project for us. Uh, this is what the inside looks like. We'll be replacing uh, the windows, uh, uh, most of which are broken, uh, in order to ensure better energy efficiency. Um, here's a project that we hope to break ground on next month, uh, uh, back to the Wayne Junction Historic District. Um, it's called the Argudo Oilless Bearing Company. Uh, quick uh, history on Argudo is that until, um, until uh, this product came out, uh, two thirds of all factory fires were caused by too much friction uh, with bearings. So Argudo uh, created a process of oilless bearings uh, their motto was 20 years without a drink, and uh, it was manufactured here in Wayne Junction to uh, decrease uh, fires. Uh, so one story facade uh, with a three story building next door, um, Attic Brewing uh, will have or already has a beer garden in the rear of this, and there will be a cafe in the three story building with office space above. So just a picture of the back of the one-story facade that we were able to save and uh, provide some structure. Um, here's a project near LaSalle that we were able to use. It's historically designated. We were able to use that zoning incentive that I mentioned before to lease it to Salvation Army uh, to lease. So it's under construction right now. It's just the rear of that property, uh, not as historic. Um, so I'm going to very quickly go through uh, Jumpstart Germantown, Jumpstart Philly, which is really my passion. We started this project uh, seven years ago, and uh, it, it really was designed for a lot of reasons, but one of them is uh, anti-blight, which really guides what I've been doing for 35 years. Uh, what we're doing is training, mentoring, networking, and loaning money to uh, aspiring real estate developers. So we're helping people get started in the industry. And more than 90% of our graduates have been women or people of color who have been historically left out of real estate development. Um, so real quick, why do we do this? Because of, we're trying to reduce blight. We're trying to improve communities while keeping gentrification at bay. And lastly, like I already mentioned, we're trying to change the face of real estate development by diversifying who's involved. Um, so we do that through a 16 hour training program. We do that uh, and then people at the end of that training program uh, get a mentor. We have 35 mentors in the program. We have a developers network that meets on a regular basis uh, pre pandemic. Um, and then lastly, uh, and I know Alan Dom was one of our speakers uh, 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 before the pandemic. Uh, and then we have a loan program, which is probably the most powerful piece of this training uh, of, of Jumpstart. 
We have committed uh, over $36 million to date. Average loan is $121,000. Um, and we've closed over 300 loans. Uh, we are uh, attempting to get another $7 million line of credit so that we can take this citywide. But for now, uh, we're focusing on six, what we call middle neighborhoods in the city. Um, to date, we've graduated over 1,800 people. Uh, we have now uh, seven Jumpstart programs in Philly that are run. I only run Jumpstart Germantown. Other people run the other programs. And we have five new programs outside the city, Norristown, Wilmington, Harrisburg, Coatesville, and Oklahoma City of all places. Uh, they came to Philly. Uh, we met with them. We uh, enjoyed some Deeks barbecue together uh, to seal the deal, and they went back home and started a Jumpstart program. Uh, we're in discussions right now with Reading, uh, PA, and Clearwater, Florida, uh, which will be starting programs later this year. Uh, we do Jumpinars uh, every Monday night, which are uh, sort of deeper dives into real estate subjects. We uh, produce podcasts and have a weekly radio program on G-Town Radio. Um, and then last but not least, we have a Jumpstart 2.0 training program, which takes more experienced residential developers and moves them into commercial real estate development. So we just graduated our first group of 25 people and look forward to doing more about that. But if you wanna know more about Jumpstart, that's a really quick dive into it. Uh, go to jumpstartphilly.com or jumpstartgermantown.com. Or if you want to start a jumpstart program, you want to go to gojumpstart.org. Um, so happy to take uh, any questions that you have. And uh, thanks for listening. Well, Ted, thank you very much, Ken. That was a really a uh, fascinating uh, tour about uh, what you guys are doing in uh, what's happening at least in this part of, uh, of town. We have a couple of questions. Um, let's jump into uh, one from Robert uh, Hollum. Uh, he, uh, he said that data indicates that racial diversity, uh, very long, very much long regarded as a precious gem in Northwest uh, Philly, has been in the, uh, the decline since 2000. Can a community development strategy to include intentional diversity? Yeah, um, I don't know. That's a very good question. Intentional diversity. Uh, you know, some people on this call uh, know much more about fair housing uh, issues than I do on how intentional you can make a community. Obviously, uh, there are some neighborhoods in Northwest Philly, particularly Mount Airy, that takes a lot of pride in its diversity and has been able to maintain it over the years, even during uh, the period of white flight. Um, so I, I don't, I'm going to be honest, I don't have a good answer to that, but, um, we believe as a jumpstart program that if we can diversify who developers are, then people can gain wealth within their own communities and therefore they will stay in the, in those communities, which I think helps to, even when you know, uh, a certain racial group is moving into a neighborhood. If we can do more to keep people in that neighborhood with programs, like I mentioned, like BSRP or AMP. Um, but also I think Jumpstart is a piece of that because if people are developing in their neighborhood, they're more likely to stay in that neighborhood and build wealth in that neighborhood, which I think can keep diversity even as neighborhoods start to gentrify. And while we are in Northwest Philly, there's a question from Mark uh, about uh, the blighted diner car on the old trolley car cafe site. Is a uh, trolley car get, diner site? Yes. Is, yeah, is it, not not happy about how that property was left while it's waiting to be developed. Um, I no longer own it, just to be clear. Um, and it's not necessarily for public consumption, but we will be taking that diner off of the owner's hands because he has decided not to use it in the new development and we're going to put it in storage we are going to renovate it and we're going to find a new home for it so 
Uh, it's ugly as it sits right now, which I'm not happy about, but um, we're going to get it out of there, um, as we did, by the way, with the trolley car that was on the site. We donated it to the Fishtown Business Improvement District, and they're still in the process of making it into an ice cream shop so that that uh, trolley car can find a new life. Thank you. Uh, Kathy has a question, uh, but she also has an announcement about the Preservation Alliance Awards that you mentioned, uh, that the, uh, the press release is out with the winners, but the event will be in June. Uh, if you want more information, go to the Preservation Alliance website for more information. But Kathy asked, uh, can, can you talk about community benefits agreement? What is the good, what is the bad, and what is the ugly? <laughs> thanks, Kathy. Uh, this was going so well. Um, uh, and thanks for uh, mentioning. Um, I do sit on the board of the Preservation Alliance for at least the next few minutes. I'm, I'm going to be uh, um, stepping off the board in June, but um, they do really fabulous work. I've seen it firsthand over the last three years, so I encourage people to support the Preservation Alliance. Um, Community benefit agreements. I don't know them firsthand. I'll say that firstly. Um, I have not entered into any CBAs myself. Um, I think it's reasonable to ask. Um, you know, I have some mixed feelings. I have, I, there's some developers that run the other direction because they don't want to interact with the community because they're afraid of a CBA. Um, and I would say the other side of that is you have some uh, community that are unreasonable about what they're asking for in a CBA. So I'll just say that. Um, but then, as usual, there's this middle group, right? There is uh, neighbors that want reasonable. Um, they want to put into writing what developers are promising, which, in my mind, any developer should be willing to do. Um, they want to know uh, who is going to work on the construction. They want to know who is going to be leasing uh, either the apartments or the commercial space. So there are certainly reasonable requests that the community makes that I don't have a problem with. And I would personally be open to doing CBAs. But like I said, a lot of developers run the other direction and a lot of the community uses CBAs to hold up the developers for either money, you know, or donations or something else. And to me, that's not reasonable either. So I would call those two things the ugly, and I would call sort of that middle ground the, the, the good. So hopefully that answers your question, Kathy. Thank you. Thanks. Um thank you. Thank you, Kathy, for the questions. Um so uh, Robert uh, asked, uh, Robert Thomas asked, uh, all of the neighbors of, uh, neighborhoods in which you are doing uh, work right now uh, need good public transit. And what do you recommend to make SECTA more user friendly? And uh, he gives some examples like bathroom size stations open to the public when the trains are running, mini maps and schedules, uh, transit staffs like New York City has. Availability of benches for people to sit down while they wait. You know, so what what is the conversation like with SEPTA? Yeah, Bob, that's that's not like you to care about public transit. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Bob obviously has been a big advocate of, of uh, SEPTA doing the right thing and pushing them in the right direction. A uh, couple things I would say, Bob. One is um, fares. You know, when you have a community like Wayne Junction, which is, I would call, low moderate income, um, you know, why, if it takes 10 minutes to get downtown, do they still charge a zone one uh, fare for that? You know, it should be equal in my mind and a lot of uh, the community's mind to, um, uh, to a subway, which also takes about 10 minutes uh, to get to the center that city. Reform. Say that again? They just announced that reform. You know, I said it and it just happened. Amazing. <laughs> they, they just announced that it's going to be subway rates. They're, they're making all the rail, trolley, but trolley uh, subway, L, and rail into the metro with free transfers and, you know, 
So you must have hit him real hard, Ken. <laughs> I mean, I have talked it up, but obviously I, I did not influence that. Uh, but I, that, that is I'll great send, to I'll hear. Send you that, is, that is one big thing. Yeah. Um, the other thing, uh, Bob, that I, I forget if you and I spoke about this, um, is that I have been hitting SEPTA hard for years, several general managers worth, um, to uh, renovate their blighted stations. They have all these, you know, Frank Furnace stations yep. that are vacant and deteriorated. And not only is it bad for the neighborhood that they sit in, but you know, they they bring uh, crime, they bring graffiti, and I believe that they push. Uh, riders away from wanting to go there, right? Um, so we have had some success over time. We, uh, Philly Office Retail has renovated uh, the Allen's Lane Station. Um, we have renovated Fort Washington and the Ardsley Stations. And we put cafes into each of them, which attracts riders. So I've been after SEPTA to put the rest out the bid. Well, uh, before Bob uh, corrects me, they have finally put them out to bid as of last week. Um, I toured the six stations that they put out to bid. There's some problems with the RFP that hopefully they will correct so that we can bid on it. Um, but there are six Northwest stations, Gravers, um, see if I can get them all, Mount Airy, Upsall, Carpenter, Allen's Lane, which is up for renewal, and uh, I missed one. Uh, is, is Queen Lane being written? No, written? Queen Lane's not on there, unfortunately. Um, anyway, I missed one, but they're all in Northwest Philly. They're all vacant and deteriorated. Uh, and if we can get our hands on them and get 20 year leases, wow. we can renovate these stations. We can sublease them to tenants. We can attract riders. Uh, and I think that would be a great thing for SEPTA. Um, and, it, it, it's it's hard for me to understand why it took so much time and effort to get SEPT on the same page, but uh, kudos to uh, Leslie, um, the new general manager who gets it. I worked with her years ago mm -hmm. uh, when she was a White Marsh Township Commissioner, yes. and, and she was responsible for us getting Fort Washington train station renovated and reused. Mm -hmm. So she, she understands, she gets it. Um, so, uh, I, you know, everything else you mentioned, sure, bathrooms, everything else would certainly be helpful. Uh, but those are two things that come to mind. Yep, okay. Uh, since uh, Ken mentioned Germantown Radio that they have a show, they, uh, I put the link to Germantown Radio. And then just on self-disclosure, I just joined the board of Germantown Radio. So. We're trying to pick awesome. that up. Uh, well, it's a question from uh, from Deborah here. Uh, what are the biggest challenges you have faced, and how have you addressed them? Biggest challenges? Uh, I don't know. First one that comes to mind, and so I don't know if it's the biggest or not, is uh, the changing atmosphere about development. There's a lot of bad development happening. And the knee-jerk reaction of communities is to oppose all development. So I feel really bad, and, and I do speak out from, on occasion on when I consider something really bad. As an example, um, freaking developer uh, tore down Wood Norton this week, which was an operating apartment building at the corner of Johnson and Wayne in order to put up new construction and get more in rent, just disgusting. And uh, I don't blame the community for a minute for uh, reacting negatively to it and, and speaking out and yelling. But what tends to happen is then there becomes a call for all, no new development. You know, let's put a moratorium on development. Let's, you know, and that's not, the right reaction. Uh, we need to uh, 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 understand that there's good development and there's bad development. And we need to keep being proponents of good development and we need to speak out about bad development. So that's just the sort of the latest thing that we're facing. And we're constantly at fear of the city. I should 
I'm going to say city council because I'm not as concerned about the city, um, uh, just putting a stop to everything we do, in which case I got to go find a new city to develop in. Um, you know, so that, that, that's, that, that's one of our biggest challenges right now. Um, here's a question uh, very much local uh, for, for me. Uh, is anything happening with the uh, restarting the Germantown Business Improvement District to clean up the trash and make the business district more inviting? I know there was a lot of uh, controversy well, to say the least in the last few years about this. Well, first, I'm going to correct you because it was not a Germantown bid. It was called GSSD, Germantown Special Services District. 100% of the board was appointed by the district council person. And I paid into it religiously every year with every one of my commercial properties and was happy to do so because I'm a true believer in street cleaning. That being said, by the end of GSSD, they were doing zero cleaning. They were just taking our money. We have no idea where it's going. We understand there's a federal investigation going on into where that money ended up. And so I and three other uh, uh, community people in Germantown opposed the renewal of GSSD and we won. And to be honest, it wasn't even hard because it was obvious they weren't cleaning the streets. Trash was piling up. I then proposed to start a Germantown bid business improvement district as we've had in Mount Airy and I co-founded 15 years ago uh, that would clean the streets on a daily basis, would provide safety services, beautification, um, all that kind of things. Um, and it's been very successful in not just Mount Airy but 11 other communities in um, the city. And that was roundly uh, uh, disapproved by a council member um, who, because of council prerogative, has say over whether a Germantown bid can be enacted. Um, so fortunately for Germantown, um, because we were sort of at this stalemate, right? We had this group we're paying into not cleaning. We were not allowed to start a Germantown bid and tax ourselves, uh, which is what I was asking for and other people were too. Um, but because of the $10 million a year that Sherelle Parker was able to set aside in the city budget, uh, Germantown and other uh, lower income communities throughout Philly um, were able to get street cleaning grants. And that is now what's happening. There's one district around Wayne Junction that gets cleaning twice a week and Germantown gets cleaned in the middle central business district two or three times a week. It's still not enough. We still need a bid because we should be doing much more than cleaning, but uh, it at least alleviated the tremendous amount of trash that has been on our streets. So thanks for that question. I'm a big proponent of a special services district. I wrote a couple of those legislation when we first started and what it can do to a neighborhood or a business district, I don't think has been fully uh, uh, used by the, all of the ones in the city except for Center City. Uh, but there's much more potential for, for that when it's done the right way. So, can I just, just to say, just to yeah. say it, Pedro, the difference between an SSD and a bid is that the SSD is appointed by um, city council, the bid is democratically elected members who are paying into the bid. I uh, just it, wanted to be clear yeah, for people. But the, this is something that could be changed here because the city council is using that authority by grace by grace of the state and then the state can also change the way that the uh the board members are elected or appointed so it could be a combination of things it's not the way that the city is doing it now it could, that could be changed but well ken i think you were a little bit modest in terms of what's happening in wayne junction i uh I've never been modest, Pedro. <laughs> no, I think in this case, I mean, this. for those of you who have not been around Wayne Junction and have not seen the transformation of the whole space, the whole area, uh, with the, uh, the, this, the bakery and then there's the brewery and then this, the, the other amenities are coming out and popping up. I, uh, you know, I often have meetings uh, or I meet with friends at the brewery and it's, I can walk from my house to, to, the, to the site. Uh, and 
could you tell us more about what do you see developing there once a lot of the ongoing projects get finished and how is that going to transform that that end of Germantown? Yeah, uh, Wayne Junction has been a fascinating project for us because, you know, everyone thinks we have all the answers. We don't So you, you stick your toe in. Right. And yeah. You figure out what's working and what's not working. You adjust. You you move forward as, as as needed. Development, by the way, is all about risk. You know, when 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 my mother in law used to say to me, "Ken, tell me in one sentence what you do." I say, "Mom, I take risk." You know, so I say that because you want to evaluate the risk involved in a project. You want to quantify that risk, and you want to manage that risk, and that's. Queen Junction is a perfect example of that. Mount Airy was a good example of that. We got in slowly uh, 15, 20 years ago. We started to renovate vacant storefronts um, on Germantown Avenue and Mount Airy Commercial Corridor is a very different place today. So we're doing something very similar here in Wayne Junction where we uh, bought up 13 uh, buildings and properties uh, before we even announce the project. And of course, as you can imagine, that's necessary because the second you announce a project like this, all your properties double and triple in, in, in value and everyone wants a small fortune for, for their vacant deteriorated uh, properties that they're sitting on. So we first did that, we then announced it. Um, I whispered it to my jump starters. So they started to buy up houses that were vacant and deteriorated around Wayne Junction so they could renovate them. Um, but what we did, uh, Pedro, was we started with 137 Berkeley Street. We put in an IT company on the second and third floor. We put in Attic Brewing and we put in Deke's Barbecue. And the, the reason that we started with that was we, tr again, listening to the community, we tried to put in uses, uses and amenities that we thought would attract uh, community members. Uh, yeah, we hope other people come in, but um, it starts with neighbors and places, as you said, Pedro, that you can walk to and, and enjoy and appreciate. So we started there, you know, next thing we know, like two months after each of them opened, the pandemic happened. So, which was the perfect test for us because if they had either failed or, um, uh, did not um, succeed uh, uh, as much as they did, we would have held off on what we call the second phase and third phase of Wayne Junction. But what happened? They both took off. Attic Brewing won some national beer awards and people were flocking to it, both from the community and outside the community. People were loving Deke's Barbecue. Our office tenant um, uh, had easier time attracting employees because of where they were located. So it just succeeded. So what that said to us is, okay, maybe put two toes into the water and uh, start renovating you know, the Max Levy building, which became 32 apartments. My offices are now right up the street. Um, we uh, took an eight acre, um, former charter school campus that went belly up and made it into office space and an adult daycare and event space and that sort of thing. Um, and we took some other buildings. We have Mertzbacher's Bakery, uh, Philadelphia Woodworking, uh, a, a, an LA company called The Pleak, which does branding, uh, just moved into one of our properties. So, you know, you can't lead, for example, with residential, uh, you had to lead in this case with commercial and then residential would come. So that, that's sort of the approach we took. And we wouldn't be suggesting what I call phase three, which is the new construction project, if phase one and phase two uh, didn't uh, succeed. So that's how we sort of approached it. And, and so far so good, doesn't mean um, it's, it's definitely a winner, but uh, you know, it's, getting people's attention. It's, it's becoming a destination that people want to go to. And it's kind of cool. It is very cool. And actually, um, you know, I had visited almost every microbrew in the city of Philadelphia. And uh, Attic is the only one that I see at that first crowd. 
uh, enjoying, uh, a, a, you know, a brew here and there. Well, Ken, thank you so much. Uh, this has been really, really enlightening and uh, really instructive uh, conversation. Uh, we thank you for your participation in uh, this uh, session of the Philadelphia Committee on City Policy. Uh, we will return uh, in April with uh, City Council Person Derek Green, who's going to talk about the very hot subject of the Philadelphia Public Bank. Uh, Tom, is there anything else we need to add before we say goodbye to everyone and thank everyone for their participation today? No, I think that's it. We're, we're done. Thank you, everybody. Have a great, great. Thanks for having me, Tom and Pedro. I appreciate thank it. Thank you, Ken. Thanks.